Hello and welcome to This Week in X. I'm your host, Peter, and we are here to talk about the X-Men comic books out from Marvel this week with a release date of February 14th, 2018. There were four comics out this week in the X-Men line. They are Cable 154, Old Man Logan 35, Weapon X-14, and X-Men Blue number 21. First up this week is Cable issue 154. Cable issue 154 was written by Ed Brisson with line art by John Mallon, color art by Jesus Abertov and Frederico Blee, letters by Travis Lanham, and a cover by John Mallon and Juan Fernandez. This issue is the final issue in the Newer Mutants arc, it's the second arc of this title, that has found Cable as sort of a, a time cop investigating crimes against time, time crimes. The first arc by James Robinson kind of had him chasing somebody through time. Here he's in a more fixed point in time. The book is referring to it as 13 years ago, which is not how any Marvel comic book talks about time travel. They're really talking about the astonishing X-Men era in 2005, but 13 years haven't passed since 2005 in the Marvel Universe. And Kondra, who's one of the externals, has been seemingly prematurely killed based on what Cable knows as have happened in the history of the current time stream. And so he slowly assembles a team to help him investigate that first long shot, then he adds Shatterstar, Dupe, and then he also adds Armor, who's just a student at the school at that point during Astonishing X-Men, and finally X-23, who at this point has never even met any X-Men, I don't think. And he's using this team, theoretically he's picked them for specific skills, but that's kind of hilarious given the full range of X-Men that are available at this time. He picked them just because Brazan wanted to pick them, honestly. And he's using them to um, kind of interrogate all the different externals and figure out who's killing who, because they've kind of got like a Highlander situation where they all want to kill each other and then whoever kills them absorbs their power and they can only really be killed by each other. It's a whole thing. So props to Ed Brisson for bringing back this 90s plot point, not because it's continuity porn, but because it's fun and it's something that hasn't really been explored fully and followed up on. And I don't feel like you need to know the whole history of comic books to understand who these characters are and what they represent in the story, but if you do know the whole... Uh, history of X-Men from the 90s, you get a little added twist to enjoying this arc. That might be the only twist you get from enjoying this arc. It's just not smart. It's a, it's a fun murder mystery for a certain amount of time, and this particular issue is the cap of that. So it's not a lot of mystery. It's it's pretty head-to-head, -head, bold face-off compared to the mystery in the previous arcs. There's not a lot of double crosses, not a lot of surprises. There's one external who clearly has been killing the other ones, and the team has got to take him down. Uh, aside from from just kind of feeling a little bit lackluster about this arc, I feel like Brazan is just making some unforced errors in terms of writing these newer mutants that Cable assembles. Again, he has armor using her power in a way that is totally not in keeping with how her power worked at that time or the progression of the char character. And you know what? If you're just reading this now, having not read that, it's probably just like, oh, cool, she's powerful and a teen. Cable's training her. So I guess I can't come down too hard on it because it reads fine as a story on its own, but it really grates against continuity since I'm somebody who's pretty familiar with these comic books. Also, the art in this issue, I have appreciated how uh, Malin has looked very much like those kind of mid to late 90s Leafield Extreme Studios kinds of artists, um, and I, I like him for that reason because I like those artists, but this issue feels a little bit rushed. There's some proportions that are just like way blown up in parts of a panel and not in others. He's really not like drawing in all the details in the background. It, it really just feels like let's cross the finish line, which is not a great feeling to get when you're picking up a comic. So, should you pick up this cable arc? I, look, if you like the externals, maybe, but you certainly shouldn't jump in on this issue, and I just feel like there were so many inconsistencies in the arc that it's really hard for me to recommend. I think James Robison's first arc, even though I kind of looked at Gift Horse in the mouth, uh, mouth at the period and was like, eh, I don't really like it, it's fun, and it does take cable as a time cop in, a, in an inventive way that's pretty kinetic and has pretty strong arc. Art. Now, the next arc is not going to be by Brazan anymore. New writers are coming on who were the writers of The Dregs for Black Mask Comics, a comic that I seriously disliked. So, not only that, it's telling supposedly a hidden tale in Cable's past. So, it's going to be not in current continuity by writers that, at least in their one effort I've read so far, I did not really enjoy. So, I cannot really say that not only you should pick up this issue, but I don't even think you should wait for the next issue. I think maybe if you love Cable or you're excited because he's going to be in the Deadpool movie, uh, read some older Cable. His 2008 series is fantastic. Or maybe read that first James Robinson arc. And you know what? If like low-grade cable is enough for you, if you love him that much, that you're like, yes, that's fine. I just want my cable. Then fine, read it. But um, not a comic I'm currently recommending to somebody who's not a X-Men completionist fan.
Next up, we have Old Man Logan number 35. Old Man Logan issue 35 was written by Ed Brazan with line art from Ibram Roberson, color art from Carlos Lopez, letters by Corey Petit, and a cover by Mike Diodato Jr. and Frank Martin. This is also an arc ending issue of the Moon Over Madripoor arc that actually resolves sort of a, a two-part arc that found Wolverine initially returning to Japan just to experience Japan, I guess, and maybe settle some unsettled business, but totally different business, winds up taking over his mission because he encounters two things he didn't expect. One is a regenerative chemical that's being developed by Silver Samurai's corporation that can make people heal very rapidly, just as Wolverine's powers work, but uh, it's also laid up hands upon by the hand, and that means that their very disposable cannon father ninjas suddenly are much more durable and much more of a threat threat, and in addition to that, the hand resurrects a major figure, major figure, from Wolverine's past. She's on the cover here, but I don't know that you can recognize her just by seeing her face, so I'm still not saying what her name was, but um, it's a fun reveal in the story. So in the last issue, we find that Wolverine and the Scarlet Samurai wake up in Madripoor, where Wolverine has brought her, but he's injured, she's a little disoriented, and they're on a mission to destroy the rest of these chemicals, and here in this issue we get to see the sort of climactic part of that mission that was underway, and then also we get to see the denouement and the anti-climax. This is actually a pretty solid issue. I know that a lot of people liked Old Man Logan as it was being written by Jeff Lemire in the parts up to Ed Brazan taking over. I wasn't in love with that series, but I can recognize why people liked it and that it was strong. I really think Ed Brazan is doing good by this character. I think that he has written him as a curmudgeon, but a curmudgeon that has, uh, you know, a little bit of an uh, emotional spot for seeing these things in his past he never thought he would see again, which Jeff Lemire also did. And I think the art has been really strong, and these two arcs in particular have been a really strong tie to past Wolverine stories that we were already aware of, whether it was Old Man Logan or Wolverine's actual history in the X-Men. So it doesn't feel like they were kind of plucked out of thin air, it feels very connected. And this issue, if you've been reading this arc all along, it's very satisfying. I still say that you should start with the first Ed Brazan arc on this title that had uh, Maestro and other future Hulk involved in it, but this this was a really fun story, and part of what I really liked here is Old Man Logan is not doing so hot, and that's part of the resolve of this climax. Like, he lost a hand, so now he's got one hand with bone claws, his healing factor isn't working very quickly, and uh, Brazan really gets it right that that Logan is no match for Gorgon and some of these hand soldiers, and so the Scarlet Samurai really needs to step in, which gives her some emotional moments where she gets to connect to her past story, and I thought it was really clever by Brazan. So I'm really kind of looking up on this title, and then we get a series of kind of post-climax scenes where they track back and, you know, talk to Silver Samurai for a little while, and that scene has a nice laugh in it, like a nice genuine funny moment, which doesn't really come very often in this. And then Logan and Scarlet Samurai part ways, and honestly, I, I'm pretty happy with this arc. Maybe you could say that it's like low-grade good because it didn't really need to exist, but what old man Logan does need to exist? If he's going to be here in a comic book and we're going to read it, at least it could look great and at least the story can be interesting, and I think that's what we got here. So Ed Brazan is continuing on this title. The next issue features Wolverine back well, Old Man Logan, back in New York and dealing with uh, Kingpin, who's currently the mayor of New York. So while you could pick it up with this issue, I still really think that the first Ed Brazan arc is the where the place to pick up, or you could pick up at the beginning of this arc. Uh, it's just been pretty darn strong, and the next arc is also going to have a pretty strong arc as well. The current artist who is tapped for, I'm just looking at my notes here, is, oh, I'm not great at saying his name, Dalbor Talagic. Uh, who's a really strong interiors artist. So I think it's going to continue to be a book with strong writing and strong art. What more can you possibly ask for? So gentle thumbs up for this Old Man Logan, but just in general thumbs up on this title, Finding a Purpose, which is something that I really was wondering if it was going to eventually do. Next up this week, we have Weapon X issue number 14. Weapon X issue number 14 was written by Greg Pak, with line art by Yildare Sinar, color art by Frank Damata, letters from Joe Caramanga, and cover by David Nath Yama. This is another arc ending issue. A lot of things wrapping up this week in the world of X. This wraps up their arc, Nuclear War. The, uh, how, where to begin? Okay, so the Weapon X team, not really a team. They get assembled against their will by a program that's trying to collect biological samples from prior Weapon X mutants and also mutants with special healing factors and Domino just cause she's lucky. Um, so that's been the main thrust of this book all the way up until this arc, and this is the first time that Greg Pak has really departed from that theme and written the team 
as a team. And the question is, like, are they really a team? And we see throughout this arc that they don't really agree in methods, they don't really agree in their morals, and that creates a lot of conflict in the middle of a firefight because they don't really act together. But they've been brought together on this, uh, this obscure island that is starting to have some genocide against mutants and also against uh, killing mutant activists on the island. And Warpath gets summoned and winds up bringing the entire team with him. And so they discover that part of this is that the island is manufacturing something they shouldn't be manufacturing, so sort of similar to the arc in Old Man Logan, and as a result, Nuke, who's a Captain America character from the past, is on this island. And so the team is kind of like kind of fighting against the military force on the island, kind of also fighting against Nuke, and somewhat also fighting amongst themselves. So my main thing with this issue is that I, I actually really like Yildre Sinar's art. I don't know that it was the best for this particular moment and this issue. He has almost like a scratchy quality to his art that reminds me of Gabriel Walta, who drew most of Tom King's vision. I think it's great, and it actually looks great in the issue, but this issue is about a couple of big kind of frameable moments, and I don't know that that is the right style of art for this, but it's still strong, so it's kind of like a weird nitpicky thing for me. Uh, Pack does what he's got to do here. He gives us a couple of moments with the team, um, and there's kind of a little bit of a deus ex machina to like get them through this final encounter, but it also somewhat helps to describe how weird and lopsided this battle is. Like, first they're way overwhelmed by numbers, but then they're facing off against the people who are fighting them in pretty equal standing, and there's a lot of push and pull in this fight that I think if you hadn't introduced some um, some element beyond just the team and their powers would start to just feel like a little herky-jerky, and I think Pack gets past that here. But the real interesting thing that he does is he seeds in some, like, actual moments for Warpath, which is a character who kind of gets left to the side sometimes, I think, when he's in X-Men comic books. But this arc really shows something about how his ethics and morality and also, you know, his maturity has changed since he originally joined Wolverine's X-Force in 2008. This is a situation in this comic book that I think Warpath would always have an opinion about, but I don't know if he would ever get in as involved as he had before. And it's interesting to watch, especially in the final moments of this issue, because he makes a pretty key decision both for himself, for the country that they've intervened in, and, and really for the X-Men in general. Um, I don't know that Pack played it as big as he could have. I think it could have been more of a Warpath focus uh, along the way, but it's clearly from the events in this as you meant to be an arc that is featuring him, and I'll take it. And it's got some fun Domino moments. I still think Pack doesn't really have a handle on Domino, uh, and maybe not also on Sabretooth, and maybe not also on Lady Deathstrike, and probably not also an Old Man Logan, so Pac's writing Warpath well, and I'll take it. Uh, I don't think you should pick this arc up. I think if you're going to read this Weapon X book, read it from the beginning so you can understand what the purpose of this team really was, and maybe appreciate them enough that when you get to this arc, you're along for the ride. I think just to pick this up, arc up cold, unless you're some like crazy fan of Nuke, I, I just don't really see it really resonating with you. But a, a strong finish, and it really helps me like the arc a little bit more that I see that we went somewhere with Warpath, and he wasn't just the setup to to get us into the story. Our final issue this week is X-Men Blue issue number 21. X-Men Blue issue number 21 was written by Cullen Bunn, with line art by Jacopo Camagni, color art from Matt Milla, letters from Joe Caramaga, and a cover by Arthur Adams with Frederico Blee. This is the second chapter of Poison X, an arc that started in X-Men Blue Annual number one, which pairs the X-Men with Venom. So let's take a step back. Um, X-Men Blue is the team of time-displaced all-new X-Men that came from the past, from the Stanley and Kirby era of writing X-Men back in the early 60s. They've been through a lot. They were written by Brian Bendis in the all-new X-Men era. They really thought maybe they should try to get back home, and so Dennis Hopeless wrote a little bit of that in the all-new, all-different era. They don't get home. They were driving around in an RV. Now, finally, after uh, Inhumans vs. X-Men, they've decided to get together and just try to be a decent X-Men team as much as they can, and they're under the tutelage of Magneto, secretly. Not everybody knows that. Uh, they've just gotten through a pretty big adventure where they tried again to go back in time, and it didn't quite work out. And so now, totally unwittingly, they've been pulled into this intergalactic plot along with Venom because uh, the team finds out that Cyclops' father, Corsair, who leads the Starjammers, has been abducted by some rogue symbiotes, uh, which are the race that, the, that Venom's symbiote, symbiote, I never, it's one of these words I don't know how to say, comes from. 
Meanwhile, I actually went back and read a lot of Venom just because I love you in this past week. And here's what's been happening with Venom. So the Venom symbiote had been with Flash Thompson as Agent Venom for a really long time, including into all new different Marvel all new, all different Marvel, and uh, in a series that wound up being really great, Venom Space Knight, I highly recommend it. It's fun and it's different if you're not too precious about what Venom ought to be. But then somewhere after that series, he loses the Venom symbiote, and it grabs onto this totally other dude for the first few issues of a new Venom series in 2017, and then when Venom switches to its legacy numbers, it recombines with Eddie Brock, who is the classic Venom that we all know and maybe some of us even love. So Brock has really changed as a character. He was previously in a, a Carnage as an FBI agent, sort of, an, at, an attached investigator that was an expert on these alien symbiotes, but and he had a symbiote, a different one, that he could be selectively infected with to power him up, but he doesn't have that now. He has the Venom ones. So, the X-Men and Venom are on a different planet. It's very like Star Wars Cantina-esque, and they're in a little bit of a fight with these rogue symbiotes, and uh, they wind up kind of in a chase with them through the planet, and they're trying to figure out who's got the Star Jammers and where. Uh, it's, you know, it's a very fun, kind of neat, low-key, not really drenched in continuity X-Men adventure. And I appreciate it for that. It's it's drawn really well. It has, most of the characters are working pretty much on voice with the distinct exception of Hepzibah in the Star Jammers, who Bun has clearly never read a style guide for. I don't know, maybe her voice changed at some point and I just like missed that issue, but she used to have sort of a weird like Yoda-esque way of speaking and now she just speaks like any other character. And the thing that I really like that Bun is doing here is there was a great series towards the end of Marvel now of Cyclops, a solo Cyclops series for 12 issues where he spent time with his dad, Corsair. Now this is the dad of the older Cyclops, but he was always lost in space and presumed dead at the point that Cyclops was a teenager. And so he's like reconnecting with this younger version of his son that he never got to experience. And Cyclops gets to have a dad for the first time way, way earlier in his life than he ever had a dad before when really Professor X was only his father figure. So I do actually recommend that series. It was, it was delightful. It was written by Greg Rucka and then John Lehman. So like high pedigree of writers, and great interior art, uh, Russell Dodderman before he was on Thor was drawing it, so just like an all-around good series. And I think Bun is really like deftly weaving in some goodwill from that series to how Cyclops is like really committed to saving his dad here. But Bun has like a big like, whoa moment in the last frame of this that I just, I could not get excited about. Venom all of a sudden is like, has gone from being nowhere to everywhere, and there's a whole race of the Venom symbiotes, and there's a whole planet, and we get to see all these different people bonded with them, and it's kind of like lost the, the specialness of it. It just really doesn't feel like unique or as interesting to me anymore, and even though I liked it in the Space Venom series, I think if we're going to do Venom on Earth, we got to leave some of that stuff behind so that we can take Venom on Earth seriously and not kind of like have this whole space-faring alien uh, part of Venom, and then in contrast just see him like swinging around between buildings. The, it just doesn't really work for me. But I think that's why it works in combination with the X-Men, because it like elevates the risk level for the X-Men and for the Venom while they're together. But all that said, I kind of winced at the final page. But, you know, I have this lit litmus test for myself where I say, okay, you think it's dumb now as a grown-up, but when you were one-third this age, which is when I was reading X-Men comic books back in the 90s, would you have thought it was cool? Now, I was a very critical 12-year-old, and I think that I probably would have had a similar complaint to the one that I have here, but I would have begrudgingly told you, you're like, yeah, that's pretty neat, I guess. And so I feel like, you know, comics are not just for discerning film critic adults, and I think that if um, you always approach them that way, they're always going to be disappointing, and we're harming the art of comic books by trying to make them into that. And so I'm going to, like, step back from that wincing of that final page and say, really is just a fun baseline X-Men story. And I always say the X-Men shouldn't always be about time travel and alternate dimensions and being hated and feared. And that's what Bun is doing here. So credit to you, Colin Bun, for writing a different kind of X-Men story. It's going to continue into an issue of Venom next. That's it for new X-Men comics this week, but I do need to highlight one X-Men collected edition that's out this week. It is New Mutants Complete Collection by Zeb Wells, and it is fantastic! It is the New Mutants series that started after Messiah Complex, and it crossed over into Necrotia and to Second Coming. And this collection collects all of the issues of its first three arcs, skipping over the Second Coming issues, and all of those arcs were great! It has the original New Mutants team reassembled, it has an awesome connection with Legion, 
Legion if you've been enjoying FX's Legion. So it's like, if you liked FX's Legion and you were excited about the New Mutants trailer and you never read the series, go and get it. The third arc, The Fall and Rise of the New Mutants, remains one of my favorite recent modern X-Men stories. Even, I guess, I read it originally in like 2011 and 2012. So five years later, I still have fond, fond memories of it. And Wells was just a spectacular writer for the X-Men franchise. And Kieran Gillen sneaks in an issue or two in there as well. So highly recommend it if you missed it the first time. It's all on Marvel Unlimited if you have that. But if you're the kind of person like me who likes an X-Men bookshelf and you missed out on those collections the first time around, some of them did get a little harder to find. And there's a great way to just get them all in one paperback. So definitely pick it up if that sounds like something that you might enjoy. That's it for this week in X. Next week in X, we have a lot of comic books. We have a new issue of Astonishing X-Men by Charles Soule. We have the final issue of Deadpool versus Old Man Logan. We have a new issue of Generation X. We have the Venom issue that extends this crossover from X-Men Blue, Poison X. And we have a new issue of X-Men Gold, plus a ton of X-Men collections. So big week in X next week. Thank you so much for tuning in. My hope is that you watch this and you feel like you're a little bit caught up in the X-Men franchise, but more importantly, if there's comics in it that you love, it helps you figure out where to get started because we keep these hot comics going in this industry healthy by buying, reading, talking about, loving the comic book. So hopefully I'm helping you do that. And that's been all for this week in X Thank from Crushing Comics. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully I will see you again next week.